It's the summer of 1990. A crew of fossil hunters pulled together by the Black Hills Institute of Geological Research had been searching through a ranch in South Dakota for months. They'd found some good stuff, some Admonosaurus bones, and were getting ready to wrap up and return to Hill City to get the artifacts ready for display. But then their truck got a flat tire, then their spare was flat, then their pump's rubber hose was broken too, so they slowly nursed the truck from their camp to the nearby town of Faith to get it fixed. But there was no sense in them all going, at least according to paleontologist Sue Hendrickson, who decided to stay back and search some more. She wanted to see if they could get one last win before the summer wrapped up. And they absolutely did. In a hillside not yet examined, she spotted the most obvious fossil. An articulated dinosaur vertebrae was visible in plain sight. Once the rest of the crew returned, she brought them to the site, and they immediately knew they'd have to delay their trip home. Over the next 17 days, the Institute team removed the entire hillside above by hand, they found 250 bones, then they carefully excavated each one. With each additional piece, they understood the exponentially increasing scientific and financial value of what they were unearthing. It was clear this was one of the most complete T-Rex skeletons ever found anywhere on Earth, so they made every move with the highest degree of caution. On the penultimate day of the excavation, Institute founder Peter Larson met with the owner of the property they were working on, a rancher named Morris Williams. He showed him the fossil, talked about its future, then Williams agreed to take $5,000 in exchange for the fossil, at least according to Larson. The exact details of that very specific moment are debated and disagreed upon as they end up being of immense importance. Treasure hunting is a tricky business, you see but it can be a genuine business. It's built upon the simple principle that, as things get older, they get more valuable, and some of the oldest objects out there are not found in flea markets or antique stores, but rather out in the wild, as yet undiscovered by humanity. But as with mining or hunting or fishing or any other extractive industry, just as tricky as extracting whatever is of value is gaining and maintaining the legal right to do so. For the moment, the Black Hills team headed back to their headquarters in Hill City, South Dakota, and began to clean and prepare the fossil, now dubbed Sue, after its discoverer, for display. It was going to be the centerpiece of their brand new Hill City Museum of Natural History, a museum of worldwide influence given the singular nature of its centerpiece, offering pride and prominence to the small community that the Institute called home. Over the next two years, community members filtered through the Institute every day to watch the work on Sue as excitement grew for its grand unveiling. But on May 14th, 1992, that dream was ripped away in an instant as dozens of FBI agents and National Guardsmen showed up unannounced on the Institute's doorstep. They were there to seize Sue. It was now part of a pending investigation led by Acting Attorney General of South Dakota, Kevin Scheifer. He argued that the fossil had been stolen. You see, Morris Williams didn't technically own his land. He was a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, so his land was technically held in trust by the federal government on his behalf. That's how reservations work. Therefore, he had to get approval from both the Bureau of Indian Affairs in DC and his tribe before selling anything from his land, which he hadn't. So that meant there were now four different entities claiming they owned Sioux. The Black Hills Institute, landowner Morris Williams, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, and the US federal government. After a long and highly publicized trial, the judge ruled that the fossil was a fundamental component of the physical land that Williams didn't technically own, and therefore it was the US government's property. But bafflingly, that was, in practice, a win for Williams as the federal government allowed him to send the fossil off for auction, which he would get the proceeds from, tax-free. This was a devastating blow for the Black Hills Institute team. What they thought for two years was their biggest win ever turned into not only a waste of two years' work, but later untangled further into a feud with the federal government that would land Larson in jail for two years due to failure to fill out a customs form to declare cash during travel. The Institute team could only watch as Sue was trucked to New York, displayed for weeks in a polished Sotheby's gallery, then finally put up for auction as Morris Williams waited to hear how much wealthier he was about to be. The answer was $7.6 million, a new record for the sale of a dinosaur fossil paid for by the Chicago Field Museum. It would be Sue's new home. Now, while Sue was a remarkably complete and well-preserved fossil, much of its record-breaking sale price can be attributed to the ironclad legal footing of its ownership. 
The US government, the institution that enforces property ownership in America, asserted that it was their property and therefore the buyer could have full confidence that it would not later be seized by another rightful owner. A scenario that occurs all the time, even to high profile buyers like Nicolas Cage. Many, if not most treasures do not sell with such confident provenance. After all, not all are found on private land, or even on land at all. There's really no telling how many shipwrecks dot the world's waters. One popular database has entries for about 200,000, another has about 250,000, while shipwreck hunters themselves populate their own secretive databases with unknown numbers. UNESCO, for its part, has put the estimate of global shipwrecks at a staggering 3 million, a number which some scoff at from either side of the total. As to how much valuable metal has sunk with these countless ships, well, that too is a mystery. Some cite the number at 60 billion worth, but with a recent finding that by itself makes up a third of that value, that number seems impossibly low. Most in the business just don't even try to put a number on the potential value. With only 5% of the ocean actually explored and only 20% of its floor mapped, any estimate of the amount of treasure held by the ocean is little more than a guess. And yet, around this impossible mystery has blossomed an entire industry of shipwreck hunting. Rather than pondering questions of scale, these shipwreck hunting operations, ranging in size, organizational complexity, and financial backing from individual pirates to US-based publicly traded companies, obsess over the wrecks they do know about, rapidly salvaging what they find to maximize profit, and when they do, fighting their way through the legal morose that surrounds the world of maritime salvage. A shipwreck produces value in a few different ways. There's the physical material that can be lucratively scrapped, there's the historical remnants that can be sold on to collectors or museums, and then there's the cold, hard coinage, the tons upon tons of gold and silver that made the world economy turn for the last 600 years. All three provide value, but it's the latter that's turbocharged this industry since the 1980s, raising the investment, the stakes, and the legal messiness to new heights. Take the 1986 discovery of this ship, the SS Central America. Led by an ocean engineer named Tommy Thompson, the discovery of this gold and silver stack ship 160 miles or 260 kilometers off the coast of North Carolina and 7,000 feet or 2,100 meters below the water was the fruit of years of relentless research and crowdfunding that pulled over 160 investors and $12 million together to first locate, then salvage the precious treasure. Once found using new age technology similar to that that found the Titanic, the moment brought Thompson fame and the promise of a wealthy future. But the moment also begged a question that's come to define the industry. Whose treasure was it? While it wasn't the federal government's, as it wasn't a US Navy ship, and it didn't fall within the Abandoned Ship Act of 1987's purview as it was too far off the coast. But it was a treasure that had been insured 130 years prior when it left from the California coast on its way to the American Northeast. And the very day the treasure made landfall, Thompson's Columbus America Discovery Group of Ohio was sued by 39 insurance companies. For the next 10 years, as the case bounced between federal district and appeals courts, the three tons of gold sat in an undisclosed warehouse in Virginia, picking up dust. Eventually the court sided mostly with the treasure hunters, awarding 92% of the cut to Thompson and his investors, ultimately a win, but so nearly a loss that it took 12 years to figure out. Making things worse for investors and the industry's image, rather than paying out the investors' returns, Thompson took the money and went into hiding. Thompson's eccentricities are of course unique, but the actual legal complexity surrounding maritime treasure hunting only compounds when national interests get involved. In 2007, Odyssey Marine Exploration successfully salvaged $500 million of silver and gold coins off the Portuguese coast and shipped their haul to a warehouse in Florida. Soon after, the Spanish government sued, claiming that the coins weren't salvaged from a host of unknown ships that had sunk in the region as the company claimed, but from the Nuestra Señora de las Mercedes, a Spanish frigate that a British ship had sunk in 1804. The case headed to federal court in the US, with Spain eventually winning out on its claim through an interpretation of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, that the cargo of a Spanish-owned ship, though sunk, was still under Spanish ownership. Five years after Odyssey painstakingly, expensively pulled it out of the water, Spanish authorities loaded the silver onto C-130s and headed back across the Atlantic. For their time, the company also had to pay a $1 million fine. 
The question as to who owns the loot that rises from the deep is one that doesn't afford quick answers. There's international maritime law of salvage, which provides the finder much of the keep, but that's bound to lose out should a sovereign state have a claim to the ship. Then there's the tricky factor that most of the accessible shipwrecks happen not out at high seas, but within the exclusive economic zones of countries, further limiting any claim to maritime laws. And should a ship have cannons, treasure hunters may as well turn around because that warship is still seen as state property. These court cases have the potential to doom treasure hunting companies. The Columbus America Discovery Group of Ohio, after all, no longer hunts for sunken ships, nor does Tommy Thompson, who's currently in jail. Yet, the industry still exists. There's simply too much potential, but it's been forced to pivot, either collaborating with governments or going behind their back entirely. This messiness is all why, in the marketplace for found treasures, the more confident the ownership, the higher an item's value. This also explains why the dinosaur fossil industry has a rather specific geographic concentration. China, Mongolia, Argentina, Canada, and the United States all have some of the world's best fossils, but only the US has a flourishing industry. That's because, rather uniquely, the US both deems fossils the property of the owner of the land on which they were found, and allows the owners of fossils to do whatever they want with them. Selling, exporting, anything. That's why, of the 10 most valuable dinosaur fossils ever sold, all came from either Wyoming, South Dakota, or Montana, and why these three sparsely populated states have become the global epicenter of this burgeoning industry. And within this region, there is no more influential industry player than Hill City's Black Hills Institute. That's because after that fateful day in 1992, they didn't give up. Within weeks of Sue's seizure, the crew packed up their supplies to head to the site of a Triceratops fossil found five years earlier by Institute paleontologist Stan Sackerson, or so they thought. Upon arrival, they determined the fossil had been misidentified. It wasn't a Triceratops, one of the most commonly found dinosaur fossils. It was another T-Rex, a species whose fossils had been found only a few dozen times in history. So they got digging. They didn't find quite as many bones as with Sue, only 190 compared to 250, but they were in fantastic condition, and better yet, this time, they were 100% sure the property was private and the paperwork was proper. Stan, as the fossil was dubbed, was absolutely theirs. Stan essentially replaced Sue. It went on to center the Institute's Hill City Museum. And while they remained committed to keeping the fossil in their hometown, the Institute, a for-profit venture, was still able to capitalize on its discovery since when one discovers a fossil, one gains ownership of its intellectual property. That's to say, the Black Hills Institute owns the shape of Stan. Considering how rare real T-Rex fossils are, the vast majority seen in museums are actually replica casts. In the case of Houston's Museum of Natural Science, DC's National Museum of Natural History, Tokyo's National Museum of Natural Sciences, dozens of other institutions, and even Disney World, the casts they display are actually of Stan, and still today, new replicas are being made and sold by the Institute for $150,000. But Stan would only stay home in Hill City for so long. You see, Black Hills Institute was majority owned by Peter Larson, but his younger brother, Neil, owned a minority 35% stake. In 2012, Peter forced Neil out of the business as their personal relationship fractured, yet because of their common ownership in the business, this familial dispute spiraled into a high-profile lawsuit. The court sided with Neil, agreeing that his shareholder rights had been violated when he was forced out without proper process, and so they agreed that the business would have to buy his share back from him. But the business didn't have enough cash on hand to pay for the fair value of these shares, so instead, they agreed that Neil would get Stan, estimated at around six to eight million dollars in value, while Peter would get the entire rest of the Institute and its assets. Stan was next seen at Christie's New York City showroom, where, along with Monet's and Van Gogh's and Picasso's, it was put up for auction on October 7th, 2020. With each additional minute of bidding, the price shot skyward, far past its estimate, and the world of paleontology looked on in simultaneous fascination, delight, and horror. Upon the strike of the gavel, Sue was sold to the Abu Dhabi Natural History Museum for $31,847,500, an inconceivable new record for the sale of a dinosaur fossil. Commercial fossil hunting, as an industry, was a lit in the 90s when Sue demonstrated its profit potential, then Stan came along and poured gasoline on that fire. The entire world now knows that sitting just under the South Dakotan soil are life-defining riches. 
Today, every rancher in the state is just waiting for the day when a fossil hunting crew comes knocking, ready to strike a deal to hopefully find the next record-breaking Tyrannosaurus Rex. At sea, the potential gains rise even higher, into the hundreds of millions, even into the billions. So too does the risk, as a shipwreck search costs a lot more than a pair of hiking boots and a lunch. With a heightened risk and heightened reward, shipwreck hunters need to be even more confident in who, if anything, actually has a claim to ownership. To establish this confidence, rather than fighting countries, they've decided to team up and take on contract work. In the midst of the multi-year legal battle with the Spanish government over the treasure it found off the coast of Portugal, Odyssey Marine Explorations began work on another project in the Atlantic, the hunt for the SS Gersopa. Torpedoed by a German U-boat in World War II, the Gersopa was known to be somewhere off the south coast of Ireland, carrying some $200 million worth of silver ingots, and lying somewhere very deep. A Navy service ship, and one that require months of background research, then weeks of exploration, then a high-stakes salvage process at incredible depths, the SS Gersopa would normally represent a stay-away proposition. That was until the United Kingdom Department of Transport opened a competitive tender process for an exclusive salvage contract of the ship. In 2010, when Odyssey and the UK government had struck a deal that gave the company rights to 80% of treasure it dredged up, the Odyssey eagerly got to work. After months of research, the project began with first finding the ship. In July of 2011, the Odyssey team took off aboard a chartered research vessel, pulling behind it a deep-toe low-frequency sonar system. Not long after, 300 miles or 480 kilometers off Ireland's coast and 15,000 feet or 4,700 meters below the surface, they stumbled across an anomaly shaped an awful lot like a ship. An exciting moment, but still just the start. Using their own remote-operated vehicle, the Odyssey Explorer, the team submerged its cameras three hours below the surface to identify the ship. With positive identification, the project entered the recovery phase, which required a new boat. Now chartering the highly advanced seabed worker, the Odyssey team, buoyed by a host of on-site specialty staff, began the process of getting the silver out, and quickly, as running the seabed worker costs about $100,000 every day. ROVs equipped with deep water cutting tools operated from the boat managed to eventually access the cargo holds, and exactly one year after the project had begun, the first few ingots came to the surface. In the two years that followed, Odyssey recovered 110 tons of silver, the UK government got its cut, historians gained access to a trove of long-lost letters that the ship happened to be carrying, and the press reveled in what was at the time the heaviest, deepest salvage effort yet accomplished. It was a massive success, an undeniably bold project that the company could in part justify because it had the confidence of being backed by the government who owned the ship, rather than facing the risk of seeing that same party in court. Such deals are becoming more common. Since 2015, Columbia has been working on what exactly it plans to do with the wreck of the San Jose, a Spanish ship sunk by British warships off the coast of Colombia that was carrying what's been estimated at an unbelievable $20 billion worth of gold, silver, and precious stones. Lacking the expertise to pull the treasure up themselves without entirely destroying the archaeological site, the country has begun the process of figuring out who to work with. Of course, with the treasure that massive, it remains to be seen what happens, as both Spain and Central American countries from which these treasures were mined both have made claims on the haul. But more broadly, a trend towards governments opting to do business with marine salvage and exploration companies offers the maritime treasure hunting industry an air of legitimacy and a sense of confidence that should it come up with a bounty, it won't be immediately seized or contested in court. But while available technology and newfound collaboration have ushered in a golden age of treasure hunting, the industry is hardly held in high regard by all. The loudest opposition has come from the halls of academia and heritage-minded institutions like UNESCO who have fought hard to leave shipwrecks as they lie rather than ruining them for financial gain. To these groups, these ships provide more by being left alone as they offer important fragments of the past for researchers while also providing a modicum of respect for those who found these shipwrecks to be their last resting spots. Somewhere there's a middle ground, where technology allows for profitable and safe removal, which can then go on to fund future research and preservation of such sites without destroying them themselves. With so many disparate parties involved, finding such a middle ground seems far off. A similar story is playing out in the paleontological world. With the sale of Stan and the subsequent explosion in the fossil industry, there's a fierce debate going on over the ethics of fossil hunting. On one side, you have commercial crews like that from the Black Hills Institute. They argue that there are plenty of fossils, and just not enough people looking for them. 
Fossils sit across all depths, but they're almost always discovered at the surface. That's because people only notice them when land erodes away to bring the bones to light, but when it does, after millions upon millions of years of subsurface preservation, the fossil is placed in peril. Exposure to the elements immediately starts damaging and degrading the bones, so if not excavated and cleaned, they'll be lost forever. Therefore, commercial fossil hunters argue that sales motivate more people to look, which leads to more fossils found and therefore saved. The academic side disagrees. Plenty of paleontologists argue that the commercialization of fossils is leading to their loss, at least to science. That's because landowners are now incentivized against allowing researchers to do their work on their land. They'd rather wait for the commercial crews to come and pay them for their bones. Therefore, the for-profit hunters get first dibs, and once they excavate a fossil, there are no guarantees that it will be available for research. Sotheby's or Christie's or other auction houses simply sell to the highest bidder, and the buyer is under absolutely no obligation to make a fossil available to the academic community. In practice, most of the major sales have gone to museums, but theoretically, the next groundbreaking paleontological discovery could end up in a billionaire's vacation home, entirely unavailable to those that can do anything more than look at it. Driven by new technology, new interest, and record-breaking sales, the treasure hunting industry is in a renaissance. The artifacts of old are as relevant as ever. And as records continue to break, the drama surrounding these treasures will only mount as the question of who owns what becomes of higher stakes and higher value. Somewhat unexpectedly, there is a weird connection between the fields of paleontology and statistics. That's because paleontology is all about using rare fossils to make big conclusions about the past. That's also pretty much what statistics is about. The field uses math to analyze limited data in order to make conclusions, and so by quantifying fossil-related data, statistical paleontologists are able to study the past. This ability to turn limited data into useful conclusions is exactly why I find statistics so fascinating, and why it was one of my favorite courses I took with our sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a STEM learning platform that helps you learn by doing. They don't just give you a deluge of text and expect you to remember everything, they use interactive exercises to teach intuitive principles and build these principles upon each other so you can end up genuinely understanding something like statistics or calculus or astrophysics. They truly know how to teach for results, which is why Brilliant is perfect for the kind of person who wants to learn because they love it, not because they're being forced to. Best of all, with their mobile app and bite-sized course chunks, it's really possible to fit learning on Brilliant into any schedule. So if you're the kind of person that loves learning, you can try Brilliant free for a full 30 days by heading to brilliant.org slash Wendover. The first 200 of you will also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription.